Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Everybody have a good Yom Kippur? Amen. Yeah, I had a person call me. They were here for the first time. Yom Kippur never experienced anything messianic before. They came for Yom Kippur and they called me the next day. He said, you know, for, the, for a feast of Israel, there sure wasn't much food. <laughs> we missed our air dinner. <clears throat> so <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32, Parsha Hatsinu. Oh, thank you. And this chapter, Deuteronomy 32, is called the Song of Moses. Now, although the song itself ends in verse 43, the whole chapter is usually referred to as the Song of Moses. But there's 43 verses from verse 1. Now, at the end of the previous chapter, chapter 31, at the end of that, God instructs Moses to write down a song and to teach it to Israel. Deuteronomy 31, verse 19. God says, Now write this song for yourselves and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouth so that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. The song tells of the coming catastrophe when Israel abandons the Torah, the law of God. The song calls to Israel to learn from the past and to look to the future. It warns them of the disasters to come when they violate the covenant. Now Moses, he composed the song and then he gathered, he called he assembled all of Israel so he could teach it to them. And he said to them, Deuteronomy 31, verse 29, For I know that after my death you will certainly act corruptly and turn aside from the way I have commanded you, so evil will fall upon you in the latter days because you will do what is evil in the sight of Adonai, provoking him to anger by the work of your hands. Now, in an interesting symmetry the Messiah warned his disciples that in the coming generations apostasy would befall them in Matthew 24 verse 12 he says I'll give you two versions the tree of life version first because lawlessness will multiply the love of many will grow cold but in the complete Jewish Bible Dr. David Stern's uh, version he puts it this way. Many people's love will grow cold because of increased distance from Torah. The further away you get from God's word, the worse off you are. And the love grows cold. Likewise, Paul warned, uh, Paul himself warned the Thessalonians that great apostasy was coming. In 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3, it says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For the day will not come until after the apostasy has come. And the man who separates himself from the law has been revealed. Or the lawless one has been revealed. The one destined for doom. In Acts 20 verses 29 and 30, Paul warns the elders in Ephesus that uh, apostasy would arise from their own ranks. His words sound a lot like the words of Moses in Deuteronomy 31, 29 that we heard before where Moses said, for I know that after my death you will certainly act corruptly and turn aside from the way I've commanded you. And so Paul says here in Acts 20, verse 29 and 30, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. Even from among yourselves will arise men speaking perversions to draw the disciples away after themselves. Then in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation draws some of its apocalyptic imagery and energy from the Song of Moses. Like the Song of Moses, the book of Revelation looks toward the coming of God's wrath upon the earth. Though he will punish Israel for its misdeeds, he will ultimately rescue them and redeem them. Revelation chapter 15 records a vision of the martyred standing before the throne of God, singing 
the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, Revelation 15, 3. Now, here's the thing. Readers unfamiliar with Torah, you know, really unfamiliar with how to understand the five books of Moses or even read it, uh, have often mistakenly understood the title Song of the Lamb to refer to the short liturgical refrain in Revelation 15, 3, and 4. But instead, the writer of the book of Revelation intends for his readers to understand that the souls of these righteous martyrs will sing the song in Hatsinu, Deuteronomy 32. They will sing that song of Moses before the throne of God. However, he calls the song of Moses by a new title, the Song of the Lamb. You see, in Deuteronomy 32, you see, Moses is the deliverer. He's the Messiah. He's the Savior. Why are you saying these things? Because it's all the same word in Hebrew. Moshiach. It means deliverer. It means Messiah. It means Savior. The one who's helping us. The one who's becoming our champion to do what we cannot do. Moses was the deliverer of his era, of his time. But now in the book of Revelation, they have another deliverer. They don't have a one of many deliverers. It's not a question of first or second Adam or first or second Messiah. You know, in the writings about King David, King David, who's been, in, he's been, ordained as king, but yet he doesn't have the throne yet because Saul still lives. And during the night, he goes to En Gedi, which is near the Dead Sea. It's a mountainous region with a lot of caves. And he goes there, and Saul is pursuing him with an army. And David is hiding. And during the night, while King Saul is sleeping, David sneaks into the cave, and he cuts off the corner now, the cor what does the corner of a coat mean? Nothing. What, what's a corner? But because Israel was required by God in Numbers chapter 15 to have affixed to the co four corners, they wore like poncho type of coats with a belt around it, right? That were longer down about by the knee. And so at the corners, there was tzitzit, which made the entire garment holy. Now, a corner you may or may not notice. But to have three tzitzit hanging from your coat instead of four, it's very easy to pick up. You put it on, you see one hanging, you the other one, where is it? So what he held up was the tzitzit, the corner of his cloak, which would have had the fringes, the tassels upon it, commanded by God. And he held that up to him, proving to him that he was right there by his side, but he chose not to harm the king. And his words were, I will not raise my hand against the Lord or his anointed. Anointed in Hebrew, anointed one, is Moshiach. Amen. That translates into the Greek as Christos. So you have multiple messianic figures in scripture, but only one who is the deliverer, the Messiah, the Savior. Now, why does the writer of the book of Revelation refer to the song of Moses as the song of the Lamb? Question, answer. Because the Messiah will be the agent of the final redemption which, of, of which the song speaks. The song of Moses in chapter 32 is talking about a futuristic event. It's a prophetic song. God did not ask Moses just to sing the song because he wanted to hear it. He specifically asked him to teach it to the children of Israel. He wanted them to sing it, to remember it. And so the tune that was put to that song wasn't done by some band of the era. It was the tune that was put to it was inspired by God himself, by the Holy Spirit. The song of Moses comes at a at a crucial moment 
However, it's also a moment filled with certain anxiety. Moses is about to die. He knows this. He completes the writing of the Torah and he warns Israel that it will be a witness against them because they are bound to rebel against it. They're going to rebel against God. When they do, we'll look out. The song should not be looked at as a chant of victory. It is not. Rather, it opens with a call to the heavens and the earth to hear, to listen, to give ear. It's words of testimony against Israel, as the Sifre says, which is a Jewish commentary. The song covers past, present, and future. Here's what it says in the Sifre about Ha'atzinu. Great is this song, for there is in it the present, the past, and the future. And there is in it this world and the world to come. Moses calls the heavens and the earth to bear witness because they also exist in the past, present, and future. You could say people come and go in this world, but there still exist the mountains and the earth and the sea, the sky, they remain. So Moses calls them that will be there as long as God wants them to be there before people are born and after they're gone and calls them as witnesses against Israel. The song will speak to all generations, from the one who enters the promised land to the one that enters the age to come that aren't even born yet. The Torah contains two great songs composed by Moses. I want to talk about this just a little bit because I think it's important. You know what? Sometimes I, I, I'm looking at Facebook or YouTube and I see a, uh, an interesting uh, pastor talking about the song of Moses. I said, oh, let, you know, let me listen to their view, you know. And it's Exodus 15. Wait, wait a minute. Why is he calling that the Song of Moses? It's not. It's not. There's two great songs composed by Moses. And these are known as, I mean, arguably, as the first songs of the world. Now we could say, no, no, maybe there's one in, in ancient culture uh, over here, over there. But recorded in a document that we have... The Song of the Sea, Exodus 15, and the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 are two of the oldest, if not the oldest, songs ever written. And they were written by God. You could say Moses wrote them down. God made the song known to his mind. Remember, it's God's charge. He tells Moses, write the song down. He had to give him the song. The first song is the Song of the Sea. The song at the sea, Exodus chapter 15, which Moses and the sons of Israel sang after the destruction of Pharaoh's army at the Sea of Reeds. All, in Hebrew, it's called the Yam Suf, sometimes called the Red Sea, but it's not really the Red Sea, it's the Sea of Reeds, Yam Suf. So the second is the song that comes at the conclusion of Moses' life, Deuteronomy 32, when Israel is about to enter the Promised Land. Moses uh, is there, in Mo and you see that. Most of the, of the chapter 32 is a song, not all of it. Moses sung this song to Israel on the day that he passed away. It was just about his last teaching. His teaching is all about don't turn away from God because if you do, it's going to get bad. And I mean really, really, really bad. singing to them about their experiences together, rebuking them for the things they've done wrong, and reminding them that even though God gets very angry at their sins, he will always come back to his people. He'll always come back to his children, each and every one. Every single human being in the world is a child of God, regardless of their age, regardless of their claimed religion. You know, in both songs, Moses, the teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu, he, um, the lawgiver and judge, he becomes Moses, the poet and the seer. Moses, the poet and the seer. Both songs arise at a defining moment in Israel's history. Indeed, the very term song, shira, in Torah implies a unique and transcendent statement. The splitting of the sea. 
right? Big moment. Everybody knows about the miracle. The, the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea split. There was a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left. And Israel walked through millions of people as if on dry land. And they didn't just take a stroll. This wasn't a, uh, the New York Marathon. They came with everything they had. Their, all their, whatever clothing they had, whatever belongings they had, sheep, goats, whatever they had with them. Little kids, the old and young, the sick, the healthy, male, female, everybody. And not just Israel, but a whole lot of other people in Egypt left with them. Remember, Egypt was at the time the most prosperous uh, empire of the world. At that time, they had, they had slaves and servants from every known province and country around. So when they left, what do you think? They were going to stick back there and say, hey, you know, let them go. <laughs> let them walk down there in the desert. We're going to stay over here where life is good. Oh, gee, let me take a look. Flies, lice, pestilence, uh, fire falling from the sky. All the animals are dead. The firstborn are dead. Uh, maybe I should go with them. So they left. You know, the, uh, those Gentile slaves looked around. They were not of Israel, but they said, hey, let's bounce. And they moved out. The splitting of the sea is the culmination of God's mighty acts of deliverance, a moment of great victory in which Israel leaves Egypt forever and the powers of the Egyptians are destroyed. It's actually each one of the plagues is kind of a put down, a war against each of the ten most powerful gods of Egypt. And each one, God showed how he is the one and true God. He gave the plagues for a reason. He could have just blinked his, his godly eyes and, and they would have been in another place, every one of them, without walking. But he took them out through great signs and wonders. And he gave the reason why. So that they will know that I am the Lord. He wanted everybody to know, including the Egyptians, including any other slaves or servants in Egypt, that only he alone is God. In Exodus 14, verses 31 to 15, verse 1, it says, When Israel saw the great power that Adonai had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, and they believed in Adonai and in his servant Moses. And then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to Adonai, to the Lord. That's the song at the sea. At this moment, Israel's bondage and humiliation are just they're swept away. And the vision of the Lord's greatness alone remains. They are slaves no more. Revelation chapter 15 again. Verses 3 to 4 states this. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. <clears throat> what then is the message of this song? It reveals God's unchanging purpose for Israel. Then it reminds the people of the threat of exile about which Moses has already warned them, and it concludes with the promise of final redemption. The Deuteronomy 32 verse 43 says this, Rejoice, you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for his land and his people. He will atone for his land and his people. This long and tortuous history, however, is not the ultimate message of the song. Its subject is not Israel, but the God of Israel. And in this song, Moses employs a distinctive word to describe him, to describe himself. In this song, he doesn't call himself Adonai Tzibaot, the Lord God of hosts, God of armies. 
Here he is, the rock. The rock. Now some of you, when I say the rock, you think I'm talking about Dwayne Johnson. But here I'm talking about the rock as in God. You know, there's, um, there's a song sung at uh, Hanukkah called Ma'al Tzur. And this, which comes from here, it's developed from, from some of these verses. And, um, and Christianity also liked the song and they made a version of it uh, and because what Ma'al Tzur means is Rock of Ages. So the Rock of Ages song you hear in churches actually comes from the Torah. You see, Israel wanders from God and must endure the trials of exile. But God remains constant. He doesn't change. He doesn't wander. He doesn't take a break, doesn't take a vacation. He's constant, unchanging, immovable. He is the same past, present, future. The rock. Tzur. He is, as the song reminds us several times, verses 4, 15, 18, 30, and 31 of chapter 32. One, two, three, four, five times he calls himself the rock. This title for God survives in our liturgy. In the Jewish burial service today, the mourners recite verse 4 as the deceased is brought to the cemetery. Deuteronomy 32, verse 4. The rock, his work is perfect for all his paths are justice, a faithful God without iniquity, righteous and fair is he. See, the word perfect used here in Hebrew is tamim. Everybody say, tamim. Tamim, tamim beautiful word. This is a Hebrew word with multiple meanings. Perfect is one way, but it also means complete, whole, blameless. Just as the song gathers uh, the troubling and contrary events of Israel's story into one harmonious whole, so all God's work is a harmonious whole. This truth is especially compelling as we face the loss of our loved ones. How many people here have ever lost a loved one? Somebody dear to them. You know, that kind of pain. That's the pain times billions and billions Time, multiplied by pi to the last possible digit of what God feels when we turn away from him. He lost a son. He lost a daughter. He weeps. As burial puts them out of sight and out of reach, the present may make little sense for us. God's eternal purposes, however, remain. In the words in, in the Siddur, the prayer book, it says, the rock is perfect in every deed. Who can say to him, what have you done? He rules below and above, brings death and brings life, brings down to the grave and raises up. Here in Parsha Ha'atzinu, listen, give ear, pay attention. Deuteronomy 32, the song of Moses, Israel faces ultimate failure and exile and is assured that God's good purpose transcends all of these things, that Israel will be redeemed in the end. Regardless of how dirty, muddy, and messed up we may become, our lives may become, our habits may become, our ways may become. God is saying to us, don't worry. We can always clean it up together. He is the rock. No circumstance can shake him or those who trust in him. Rock speaks of solidity, dependability, dependability and unchanging purpose. But the Torah re reveals yet another aspect of the rock. It is from the rock that God provides water to the Israelites. You ever see that in the Bible? Out of a rock comes water. I don't know about you, but I've never hit a rock and had water come out of it. It hasn't been my personal experience. The rock becomes the source of mercy in life. No water in the desert means death. Why does God choose a rock? It could have come right out of the sand, but it comes out of a rock. 
For this reason, the song speaks of the rock of salvation. Verse 15, the rock of salvation. And in verse 18, the rock who gave you birth, who gave you life in a striking blend of images. An old midrash, an old kind of study on this text, says that the rock that provided water for the Israelites followed them around throughout their wanderings until the death of Miriam. For nearly 40 years, almost to the last, their whole time in the wilderness, this rock followed them, the same rock. Wherever they were, the rock rose. When they needed a drink, there was the rock. In, the, uh, in a supplement commentary to the Mishnah uh, called the Tosefta, in a section of Sukkot, here's what it says. Remember, this is commentary, not Bible, but it's interesting, so I'm going to share it with you. And so the well, which was with the Israelites in the wilderness, was a rock, the size of a large round vessel, surging and gurgling upward, as from the mouth of its little flask, rising with them into the mountains and descending with them into the valleys, wherever the Israelites would encamp, it would make camp with them. Forty years in the desert, never without water. Forty years in the desert, never without bread. They had manna. Now maybe they wished for a bagel or a, a nice loaf of Italian bread, but they got manna every day for 40 years. They didn't go hungry. The rock that Moses struck, right? He strikes the rock to bring forth water back in Exodus 17, verses 5 and 7, has become a well supplying water for the Israelites every day of their journey. 365 days a year, every day, morning, noon, and night, whenever they needed water. And you're talking about, well, just the Israelites. No. The Israelites, as in the men, the women, the children, the older people, the sick people, the healthy people, the non-Israelites, who were attached to the tribe of Judah, by the way, for, for their protection and guidance. And they were there encamped. But is that it? Is that the only ones who needed water? No. They had all their flocks and their herds with them. It's a lot of animals. You could say that the ancient Israelites had animal magnetism. Okay. Tough chapel. Just as God supplies the manna every day, so he provided water. The rock represents all that is steady and immovable. Yet in God's merciful purposes, the rock moves to follow the children of Israel in their wanderings, the unchanging rock that spans past, present, and future, enters the present circumstances of the children of Israel. Now, let's jump into the New Covenant for a little bit because I want to I want to provide some clarity here in what's going on. Because a lot of this might seem like supposition for me. So let me back it up with some scripture for you. Now Saul, Rabbi Saul, or Paul, develops this midrash, this kind of study, if you will, in the scripture of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For those of you thumbing quickly through your Bibles, it comes right after 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, if that's any help. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, Paul writes, Our fathers all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock, which followed them, and the rock was Messiah. Yeah, he wrote that. Now, I'm sure a bunch of you have heard that before. You've heard it related to the rock in the wilderness before, but I bet you haven't thought about it in a long time. You don't go around and thinking every time you get a drink of water that the ancient Israelites had a rock following in the round giving them water. Some of us have to get our water online. Some of us get it from our kitchen sink. Some of us had to go to Acme to buy it. The mystery of Messiah is that he is the rock. The mystery of the Messiah is that he is the rock, the eternal and unchanging one. And he is also present to every generation in need of the supply of the waters of life. You see, to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, he says to her, 
if you would come to me, I would give you living water and you would never be thirsty. She said, where is this water, Lord? I, I want this water. She wants the water. Everyone who knows that it's there wants it. It's eternal life. He gives you, just as he followed Israel around in the desert in the form of a rock, now he becomes our rock, the rock of our faith, the rock of our hope, the rock of certainty that when we go from this body to a perfected body, when we are transformed into a different form of ourselves and we exist with him in the kingdom, he will always be our rock. He's not just our rock now when we need him. He's going to be our rock every day and every time for all eternity. He's always there for us. So in the moments when we feel alone, in the moments when we feel there's no one out there helping me and everything is going wrong and everything is going bad and I can't believe this is happening to me. Why is this happening to me? How come it doesn't happen to somebody else? How come every time I go to the bus stop, it just left? And then I see somebody who gets to the bus stop and every time it's like every day I see them and they just make it and I never make it. Why is that? I was there 10 minutes early and I still missed the bus. I got there a half an hour early and I went too late and I had to wait 40 minutes because it was late that day. It's like, why does this always happen to me? And you know, things are much worse in some people's lives that they're going through at a particular moment and challenge. But the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb is telling us, don't worry, don't be afraid, don't give up. I'm always there for you. I'm always with you. But Lord, if you're always with me, why do I always miss the bus? Because there's someone who rides that bus that's a predator and I, that would have eaten you up like a lion to a sheep and I don't want you on that bus. You take the next one. And if you knew that, you would say, oh, yes, Lord, I'll take the next one. Or I'll take an earlier one or a different one. But I won't take the 930 bus or the 830 bus or the 730 bus or whatever it is. And I'm using one example. But there's so many things in our life that don't go our way. And the problem is we want things our way. But this isn't Burger King. This is kingdom. Numbers chapter 21, verses 17 and 18 say something beautiful. It says, spring up, O well, sing to it. The well that the princes dug, that the nobles of the people sank with the scepter and with their staffs. You know, Ramban, like Rambam, was one of the sages of Israel. He's, all, he's, uh, he's also called Nachmanides. Not Maimonides, he was a contemporary. Nachmanides, N-A-C-H, Nachmanides. One of the great Torah commentators sees the song of Ha'atzinu as a prophecy of the Messiah. In an age that God institutes according to his mercy alone, whether we deserve it or not, which is very interesting, that's grace. He writes... Ramban, Nachmanides, he writes, this is, you know, a thousand years ago. In this song, there is no condition of repentance or service of God as a prerequisite for the coming redemption. But it testifies that the evils will come and that we will endure them. And that he, blessed be he, will not destroy our memory. Rather, he will return, will punish our enemies. You see, Nachmanides, Ramban, sees this gracious promise as a fitting conclusion to the writings of Moses. Certainly we shall continue to believe and look forward with all our heart to the word of God by the mouth of his prophet Moses. Peace be upon him. And I couldn't resist jumping to 1 Corinthians 10 again, 1 to 4. Gives us depth and concept to all of this. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4. For I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters. I w I'd like you to close your eyes for a moment. Please, close your eyes and, put, and, and imagine that you're in a first century community. Okay, whether it's in Ephesus or you're in Athens or you're, you're, you're in Jerusalem and Paul's talking. 
He's the one writing this. For I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. They were all immersed into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and drank and all drank from the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Messiah. So you can open your eyes now if you like. You see, all the supportive commentaries and scriptures and analogies lead us to a scripture that verifies this. Judaism calls it codifying. But, but here it's codified. We've added everything up and equals the fact. The rock is the Messiah. Messiah is the rock. But I thought God is the rock. I don't know. If anybody has John chapter 1 in their Bible, take it out and look it over once in a while. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is God. The Word is the Messiah. Messiah is God. Messiah is the Word. The Messiah is God's mouthpiece. God speaks to us, we die. Messiah speaks to us, we listen. Man cannot stand to be in the direct presence of the glory of God. We'd be vaporized like the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. They came at the wrong moment, bearing an unauthorized offering by fire to the Lord. And fire came out from the ark of the Lord and vaporized them. If we are with sin and we can't help but being with sin there are the bible says there are no none righteous no not one we are we're, we're conceived in sin we're born in sin it's part of our nature all of us have fallen short of the glory of god but god promises us something else he's given us the messiah as our rock and he's giving us a helper he's given us a helper the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit that walks alongside of us. Where? You can't see him, but he is there. Well, and how tall is he? We can't measure him that way. How tall? How big? Is he handsome? Is he? But we have, he's, Yeshua says to us, the Messiah says that God is spirit and he must be worshipped in spirit. Let me close with this. Whether we are Jewish or non-Jewish, whether we are Israelite or Gentile, as we seek to find our part in this journey, our place with God, there is a clear message for us as well. The same creative, life-giving spirit dwells among the community of those united with the Messiah, Yeshua. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 for it was by one spirit that we were all immersed into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. The spirit of God dwells in the midst of those who follow the Messiah. And through his power, we find and we fill our part together in the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb, music to our ears. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.